Que no era el malo momento. ¿no? I to love God. I don't know about you. I, just, I love Jesus. I love His people. I just love people. Yeah. But before I start, I just want to thank you for being here, welcome you. Uh, I always like to do that. I always like to look out and see. It amazes me that you come every week. <laughs> Knowing I'm going to talk, you, you still come. <laughs> and uh, just for the benefit of the of the tape and maybe the video, I want to say if you're ever around us, ever want to visit us, then you are sure welcome. We love to have you. We'll make you feel at home. Meet every need you may have or try to. Just invite you to come and be with LifeGate Church. It's a unique, special place. Amen. Well, this coming Thursday, we will all begin a new year, a new calendar year, a 365-day trip around the sun. And in that 365-day trip, we'll all experience all the, all the seasons. There'll be winter, spring, summer, and fall. That's the natural. And the spiritual, those things will happen as well. There will be winter. Some of you are in winter right now. In the natural and the spiritual. Some of you are in summer, though it's winter. It's a good time for you. You're being very productive, but you're going to experience all of those seasons in this 365-day trip. You're going to have good times. You're going to have some times that aren't so good. But there's 365 days, and what I want to talk to us today is not so much about you, but about the people that are going to be experiencing those trips also, experiencing those seasons in this trip that they're making. They're going to be going through all those seasons in their lives. And I want to talk to you today about who do you intend to reach this year with the gospel of the kingdom, with the good news of Jesus Christ? Who, who do you plan on impacting this year? Who do you plan on helping? And so that's what I really want to talk to you about. So the title of my lesson today is called Good News to Everyone, Everywhere. And if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, it's okay if you don't, but I hope you do, then turn to Mark chapter 16, verse 15. I will be there just as quickly as I end praying. It'll be the very first verse that we look at. We'll be looking at many. And you're always encouraged to follow me through, but they'll be up there on the screen so we can save time and just keep moving and cover lots of ground. But uh, I want to pray and ask the Lord to help us, and we're going to have fun. Father, I thank you. Lord, I, Lord, I pray that every person that, that uh, hears me today, that hears the tape, that watches the video of this service, Lord, will be touched the way you've touched me this week. I pray, Lord, that I'll be able to communicate well what you've shown me. I pray, Lord, that our hearts are now ready to receive the good seed of the kingdom. And Lord, it'll bring forth much fruit, 160 and 30 fold. I pray, Lord, that as we sow it, Lord, it'll bring forth fruit in its season. We won't go digging it up, but Lord, we'll just allow you to water it and to bring it forth. And Lord, we recognize that there are people out there that you want us to talk to about Jesus and that give them good news. So we ask you to help us in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says this, And then he told them, Go into all the world and preach, preach what? The good news to everyone, everywhere. Now that's what the Living Translation says. If you have the King James Version, it says the gospel. I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But it's good news to everyone, everywhere. In other words, another way of saying that is that God doesn't want there to be anyone in our lives that we haven't talked to about Jesus. He wants everybody to know the good news about Jesus and what that good news really is. And it's not just to go to church. I want you to know something today. The good news is more than being religious. The good news is good news. Amen. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But there should be no one in our lives that does not know that we know Jesus and does not know that we want them to know Jesus. Go to the whole world 
Tell everyone, everywhere, the good news. That's what he said to do. That's called the Great Commission. Now what I've done today is I've given you cards. There should, you should have two cards. Should have been in your seat. If they were not, or if somebody took yours, then if you'll raise your hand, we'll get you two more. It's very important that you have two cards. We have a hand right back there. So if you'll hold your hand up, we've got, we'll take care of you. But make sure you have two cards. It's very important that you have two cards in your possession. Now, most of you know what these are for. We do this every year. We write our names on there, people that we want to impact, that we want to pray for, that we want to try to bring into the kingdom of God. I encourage you today not to fill them out immediately. Don't jump in there right now and fill them all out. And sometimes you fill out the front and the back, and, you know, and, and then we'll get another card and fill it out as well. But, but just hold on just a second and let me talk. And as you hear me talk today and share with us what the Lord's shown me this week, and as people then begin start starting to come to your heart and the Lord begins to reveal people to you, then write those names on there. Write them as we talk. Don't just jump in there all of a sudden and, and write them. Now, now surely uh, you may, they may be the ones that you do end up writing, but, but let's just let the Lord work on us. Let him, let him show us by His Spirit people that He want, wants us and desires that we impact. Now what we'll do is I want you to fill out both of those. As they come to you, you fill out both cards. You put the same names on both cards. Now what we'll ask you to do at the end of the service, and I'll give you more instructions as we end, but we'll come down, and I'm going to ask you to come down Put one of those cards into the container right there in front. Take a match and then come over here and light a candle. One candle so that everybody can get a candle to light. Light one candle representing your desire to be a light for them. To bring them from darkness into His marvelous light. Representing your desire to and your commitment to be a light for them. To help them come into God's light, into God's Goodness. And then you can go and pray. If I forget to say that after a while, you can go pray for a little while and we're immediately going to move into a baptismal service. But, but, but do that for us. And then every week, what we're going to do is we pray for these people. Every day, nearly, they're prayed for. Uh, I'll pray for them. Pastor Lance will pray for them. And I'm hoping that this year we can even get people to come by during the week and take these cards and pray for them more emphatically. But they are prayed for every Sunday. Every Sunday it's a part of our service and they're lifted before God and we're asking the Lord to move upon their lives. So that's what we're going to do at the end. But right now what I want you to do is listen to me. And as the Lord begins to reveal things and people to you, then write their names on both cards. Now I asked you to write their names. Why, did I, why do I ask you to do that? Well, something supernatural takes place and happens when we write a vision. See, the Lord wants us to have a vision for these people that you're going to write. Not only pray for them, but take it to another level, into another dimension, into where you're literally in the spirit dimension, in your heart, you are seeing this person respond to the good news that you're going to be telling them. See this happen. The book of Habakkuk tells us to write our vision. It says in Habakkuk 2.2, 2, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, so he may run that readeth it. See, the Lord wants us to envision these individuals coming into the kingdom of God. But He also wants us to envision you telling them the good news. He wants to, you to tell them. He wants you to be able to start seeing them coming into the kingdom of God. Preparing what you will say to them when you have the opportunity. Envision yourself talking to them. If you will do this, it won't catch you off guard. When it does happen, it won't catch you by surprise. You will already know what you want to say, how you're going to say it, how you're going to approach it. It will already be envisioned. Envision them also responding to what you say. Envision them responding to your invitation to come to church. Envision them coming with you. Envision the place that they will set beside you. Envision that. Begin to pray for that place. Keep them in a vision of them coming into the kingdom. Envision them coming on a consistent, regular basis. Envision them lifting their hands and worshiping God. Envision them praying. Envision them receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Envision them beyond that into going into the ministry, into the vision that God has for them that they will have their own vision. So envision not just, not just them praying a prayer with a preacher, but envision their salvation. Envision them experiencing the goodness of God. Take it to the next layer. Now I want to show you a couple of more versions of that translation that we just read from the King James Version from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. The Living Bible says it this way, And the Lord said to me, Write 
my answer on a billboard, large and clear, so that anyone can read it at a glance. In other words, make it and put it in a place of prominence in your life. Don't stick it in a book so you'll never read it again or never see it again, but put it in a prominent place so that it becomes very, very clear to you on a consistent basis so you can read it. Now, what I'm going to do with mine is I'm going to take mine and hang it on my rearview mirror. Now, I know that'll work for me because, you see, my grandson, my oldest grandson, he made me this. It's a little rat. Yeah, it's a little puppet rat. He made this for me over a year ago, and he brought it to our daddy, and he gave it to our daddy. Now, it's, it, they drew it, and then he tried to cut it out. He, it's, it's, I love it, you know. It's, it's whacked up a little bit, but hey, it's, that's cool. He doesn't have but one arm, but he's okay, you know. This is my jack rat, and, and, and it has his name on it. And it has a little pipe cleaner tail, you see. And so when he gave me this, I took it and I hung it on my rearview mirror. Now, when I get into my vehicle every day to back out of my carport, what do I look into? I look into my rearview mirror. And there is my Jack. And so every day, that one of the first things that I do is I think about Jack. I pray for Jack. I have him right there. I'm coming to work. I'm looking in my rearview mirror. There's Jack. And I'm thinking about, I'm going fishing. I'm looking in my rearview mirror. Make sure the boat's still back there. But I'm looking in my rearview mirror. And there's Jack. You see, it is ever before me. It's like a billboard. And no matter where I go or what I do, it's right there. Put yours in a prominent place as well. Now, yours might not be, you know, your, your rearview mirror, but maybe it is. I don't know where yours might be. Yours might be on the mirror in your bathroom where you put on your makeup or where you shave. Yours might be on your computer screen. Yours might be uh, in your lunchbox. So you know where it is. It might be, you know, where a prominent place for yours would be. But you say, I'm going to take mine and I'm going to hang it on my rearview mirror. And every day, wherever I go, I'm going to think about these individuals. And I'm going to have a vision for them. I'm going to envision myself talking to them. I'm going to envision them responding and coming to church. I'm going to envision them receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I'm going to envision their life being changed as I share with them the good news. So, I think that's pretty cool. So you have a place where you can make it as a billboard as well. And then one more translation of that uh, particular passage in Habakkuk 2.2 says from the Mes Message Bible, it says, And then God answered, Write this. Write what you see, write it out in big block letters. And here's the part I want, so that it can be read on the run. Now see, the enemy wants us running. The enemy wants us busy. He wants us so busy that we can't even pray for our own selves or pray for our own families, much less pray for someone else, you see. He wants us busy. And we get so busy sometimes that we forget the most important thing that we're supposed to do on this planet, and that's to go, for, go to all the world and tell everyone everywhere the good news. And so what he wants us to do is become busy. So what you want to do, and we all get busy, we are all busy, we, we, we run in a busy world to get everything done that we want to do, it, it, we have to be busy. So what you want to do is put that in a place so that even when you're busy, you'll see it. Say, I don't care how busy I get, I've got to get in my car. I've got to go to work. I, I've got to go fishing. I don't care how busy I get, I have got to go fishing. And see, there, is, there, is my, there are my names right there. And I'm going to be going up to the, up the interstate, and I'm going to be praying for these people. I'm going to be envisioning them coming into the kingdom of heaven. So no matter what you do, make sure that you write their names, you get a vision, envision them coming in, responding to the good news that you're going to tell them, put it in a prominent place, and keep it in a place so that even if you become very, very busy, it's still right there in front of you. That it'll always stay. Now, if you don't, what will happen is you'll do just like we always do. We become complacent. We forget to pray for them. And next thing you know, we've done a whole year and we haven't really impacted their lives. See, life is short. We're not here forever. We're only here for a little while. And we need to make the best of it. We need to touch as many lives as we possibly can every year that God gives us to touch them. So envision them coming into the kingdom of God and write it down and make it clear. Now, Jesus said to preach or to announce this good news to everyone, everywhere. It's good news, people. I want you to I want you to hear. Now, if you have a King James Version, this is what it says in Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You see, when I think the word gospel, I start thinking about something religious. 
I don't know about you, but when I start thinking gospel, I think I got to go and preach to them. But that's not what he's meaning here. See, the word gospel means good news. He's not wanting us necessarily to go and preach the Bible to them so much as it is go and tell them good news. Now, what is good news? Well, let's go ahead and settle on this. What is good news to a person who is physically sick? What would be good news to a sick person? How to be healed. Would that not be good news? Right? So that person doesn't need you to come and dangle them over hell. What that person needs you to do is come to them and minister them the good news of how they can be healed. What is good news to a person who is experiencing financial difficulty? What would be good news? How to be prosperous. So we would share with that person good news. If you will come into the kingdom of God and you will serve the Lord God Almighty, He will give you an abundant life. He will prosper you in every kind of a way. What is good news to a, to a family that has a rebellious child that's maybe on drugs or, or, or in total rebellion? What would be good news to that family? A pistol? <laughs> good news would be, how did I get my, my child delivered? How can I help my child? You say, so you want to tell them good news. Not necessarily preach to them and tell them that they're going to go to hell when they die. Jesus said to tell them what? Good news. To how many people? Everyone. Everywhere. You see, we've got to get that understanding. We've got to understand what he says. You see, people, there are, there's a whole world out there that, that has never felt the closeness and the love of Jesus Christ. There's a world out there. You know people that are hurting. You know people that are broken. You know people that are sick. You know, people that have families that are being torn apart by rebellious children or by divorce. You know, people that have lost their jobs. You know, people that are experiencing all sorts of difficult things, you see. There's a whole world out there. And what we are asked to do by God is to go into all the world and tell them good news. We are to be as it would be if Christ was standing there talking to them himself. Now, let me show you this, this verse in, in the book of, uh, of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, it says this, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is using us to speak to you. We beg you as though Christ himself were here pleading with you. You see, when we talk to people, it should be just like Jesus was talking to them. To receive the love he offers not receive the judgment, but receive what? The love. See, it's the love and the kindness of God that brings people to repentance, not dangling people over hell. Receive the love he offers you. Be reconciled to God. That is what will reconcile people to God, is when they really see Christ in us, the hope of glory, when we can really come and share with people good news. Now, I don't know about you, but I really like for people to tell me that they see Jesus in me. I was, uh, was talking to someone this week on the phone. And the person's here today. And, and the person told me, said, when I pray, I pray that I'll be like Delbert. I said, well, I don't know so much about that. <laughs> and they said, well, I do. I always want that smile you have. And I always want to have the joy you have. You see, that's what we are. We are ambassadors for Christ. And when we go and we share the good news with people and we make people smile, you see, if people are ever going to experience the arms and the love of God, it's got to be your arms. If they're ever going to see the smile of Christ, it's got to be your smile. If they're ever going to hear a comforting voice of Jesus, it's got to be your voice. We are ambassadors of Christ. And what you and I have got to do is come to a place where we take responsibility for the job that we're given to do. You see, we are given a job to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, everywhere. You see, we've got to take on the responsibility to reach our family, to reach our friends. We have got to make that phone call 
We have got to take a responsibility that I'm supposed to be an ambassador for Christ. And if this person is going to come into the kingdom of heaven, what I really need to do is I need to call this person on the phone and let them hear the voice of Christ. I really need to write that letter. I need to write a love letter to somebody that I know. I am a written epistle, but sometimes, sometimes just writing a note to somebody means so much to them. I have got to talk to my friend at school or my friend at work. I've got to tell everyone that I know, everywhere that I go, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And somewhere along the way, if we're ever going to shake this region like we really want to shake this region, every one of us has to take on our own personal responsibility of reaching the people that God's put into our lives. It won't happen unless we become ambassadors for Jesus. You see, what an ambassador does is he acts as this, he represents the person who has sent him. He acts as that person. And when we go forth as ambassadors to Christ, we are going forth as with Jesus. And it's not just to preach to them. It's not to dangle them over hell. It's to tell them the good news. Now, as I was studying this this week, it was interesting to me that I saw a few things and I one, one of the things that, 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 that was quickened to me was a very interesting thing that Joseph said in the book of Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Now you remember, you remember the story about Joseph and his brothers, how they sold him into, into slavery and he went through all of these things and finally he found his destiny, he found his dream. But this verse says this in, in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, it says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, look at this, the saving of many lives. You see, what the enemy has meant for harm, God will take and turn for good, for the saving of many people. What the enemy has come upon the people's lives whom you know and meant to harm them with sickness, with bankruptcy, with divorce, with broken homes, with rebellious children, with religion. What God will do is take that and make it good if we will just teach them the good news. I want to show you some of these examples because this is how Jesus operated. As I began looking at this this week, I began seeing how Jesus taught the good news. He never dangled people over hell. You see, some people think you can't save people unless you dangle them over hell. Right? Judy says, Delbert, if it was true, if all you had to do was save people, was to get them scared and frightened, all they'd have to do is ride in a car with you. <laughs> so we know that doesn't work. They just want to get out of the car with you. Now, that's true. They will pray while they're in there. <laughs> <laughs> But you say, that's not what Jesus, I never saw, I never see him in the Bible, in the scriptures, ever dangling anyone over hell. He never threatens anyone. You know, instead what he does? He talks to them and gives them good news. Do you remember, remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Remember that story? Jesus is with his disciples and he sends his disciples off to get, get them some food. And while he's there, this woman comes to the well. And this woman is at the well, and, and he begins to have this conversation with her. Now, she's had a rough life. She's, she's had five husbands, and the man that she's living with now was not her husband. And so Jesus begins conversing with her. And you remember what he did? He said, if you don't repent and stop this, you're going to go straight to hell, and you're going to burn in eternity. Is that what he did? No, what did he do? He told her good news. He shared with her what she needed. Let me read you the passage in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4 verse 18 it says, For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. Now this woman was rejected. She was an outcast of religion. She surely could never have a ministry. And in today, this hasn't changed a whole lot. In most churches, this woman would be considered an outcast, would she not? And she surely could never have a ministry. But she wasn't an outcast to Jesus. He loved her. He wanted her in the kingdom. And he didn't dangle her over hell. What he began to do was understand the woman and began to minister good news to her. See, this woman had had five husbands and was living with another one. She was thirsty for men. She was thirsty for men. She wanted one wasn't enough, two wasn't enough, three wasn't enough, four wasn't enough. She was thirsty for men. So she was trying to quench her thirst with men. 
And what Jesus said to her is, if you will come into my kingdom, I will give you living water and you will never thirst again. He gave her good news. What she needed to hear was not that she was going to go to hell, but how to overcome this situation, this problem that she had in her life. Now, we all know people like this. They may, it may be sex. It may be drugs. It may be money. But they, there's never enough. One, two, three, there's never enough. And they've always got to get more. And so what we want to do is we want to write their name on these cards. If God is quickening somebody to you like that, write their name and get a vision, an envision of them coming into the kingdom of God. You want to see yourself talking to them that if you will come into the kingdom of God, God will quench that thirst for you. He will deliver you from those drugs. He will deliver you from that alcohol. He will deliver you from those addictions of pornography or whatever it is that has you grasped. You see, give them good news. Don't dangle them over hell. It's good news. And to her, what she needed was something that would quench that thirst. And he says, if you'll just come in, I will give you water, living water, and you'll never thirst again. It so ministered to her that she went and she went to the whole city. See, she got her ministry because Jesus preached to her, taught her good news. She went and won the whole city for the kingdom of God. You don't know what that drug addict or what that person uh, caught up in addiction is ever going to do. You don't know. You just don't know until you tell them the good news that God begins to work in their lives and change their lives. See, what changes people is the goodness of God. And as she changed, she went and she went in a whole city. Now, you know people like that. Write their names down if you're thinking of one of those. Write their names down. They're addicted. They're caught up in something. Something's got them and it's hindering them from coming to the living God. But well, what you need to do is not dangle them over hell. What you need to do is go tell them the good news. Tell them Jesus will give you living water. He'll allow you to worship Him in spirit and truth. You can come into the kingdom of heaven and envision yourself telling them that. Envision them, envision them responding to you telling them that. Envision them coming to, you, to church with you. Envision them sitting beside you. Envision them receiving Jesus, worshiping Jesus, praying. Envision their life changing. And that thirst, that unquenchable thirst that they have, being quenched by the living water that Jesus can give them. Give them the good news. But don't stop there. Envision them in their ministry. Because God has one for him or her. Amen. See, that's what the good news is all about. Some of you know people that are sick. Some of you know people that that are sick and, and maybe they're angry with God because they can't get healed or, or they're, just, they're, just, they're just out there. Well, see, Jesus took that and turned what the enemy meant for evil to put sickness on somebody and he took that and he turned it for good so that many could be saved. How many times did Jesus heal people? There are multitudes. He used it as a tool. He used what the enemy meant for evil, for harming people, and he took it and he used it for good. And what you and I have got to learn that truth. Whatever somebody's going through, if we can get a chance and an opportunity to tell them the good news. You know people that are sick. See, what they need is not to be told if they're not saved, you're going to go to hell when you die. What they need to be told is how to get healing. They need to be told to come to church. You need to become told that if you'll go to church with me, God will heal you. Our preacher and our elders, they pray for people every week. How many of you really believe that God at some point in time has healed you? Would you raise your hand? Now hold your hands up. How many of you really believe that at some point in some time that at these altars prayed for by people in this church that God has touched you and healed you? Now see that? Now listen, you should have, you should absolutely have confidence and faith that you can go to somebody and tell them that God will heal them if they'll come to church with you. Because He will. Tell you a joke. Is it a good time to tell a joke? It's always a good time to tell a joke, right? There was this guy who had a dog and he wanted his dog trained, but he wasn't being very successful in training his dog. So he found this charismatic evangelist. That's funny right there. He found this charismatic evangelist. And this guy, this charismatic evangelist said, I'll train your dog for you. Let me have him today. You come by tomorrow and see what progress we've made. He said, well, sure. So he gives the charismatic evangelist his dog and he takes him home. And so sure enough, the next day, the owner of the dog goes by to see how the dogs do it. And, and he walks up and so the charismatic evangelist is going to give him a little demonstration. So he throws a stick and he gives the command, fetch. 
And the dog runs and he picks up the stick and he comes back and he lays it right down. I said, wow, that's pretty good. He says, watch this. So he says, he gives him the command, sit. And the dog sits immediately, just sits. The owner of the dog says, wow, that is really, really good. Let me try. So the command heal and, and when you're, talk, when you're do, working with the dog means get up, walk with me, get prepared to go do something. So he gave him the command heal. And the dog jumped up on his back two legs, laid his right paw on the man's head and said, you be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's impressive, isn't it? Healing is impressive. When people are healed by the power of God, I'm telling you, it's impressive. And Jesus used him. Why do people go to Benny Hinn meetings? Is it to get teaching? Come on, talk to me, somebody. Why do they go to Benny Hinn meetings by the thousands? To be healed. It is a tool. Jesus used that tool. We need to use that tool. You know people who are sick and are not serving God and not serving Jesus Christ. You need to write their names down. You need to get a vision. Envision them coming. Envision you're talking to them about coming to church. If you'll come, listen, do you know what? People would follow Jesus around for days and days, walking around in the wilderness, hearing him talk and talk and talk until finally he would pray for them. I mean, they would just, they would, he would, they would listen. They would listen to him for hours and hours just for an opportunity for him to pray for them. Tell people that they'll come to church. And if they'll come with you to church, that they can come down, be anointed with oil, the preacher, the elders, anybody that you want will pray for you and God will heal you. And we say, well, what if God doesn't heal me? What if he does? First of all, what if he does? But secondly of all, that's not our job. What's our job? To pray for them, right? That's God's deal. He'll do the healing part. We do the praying part. We do the event. We get them here. We get them here. And we pray for them. And God will heal them. It's interesting to me that the, the, the verse of Scripture that I gave to you in, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, the verse I gave you about going into all the world and teaching the good news to all people everywhere, it's interesting to me that in that same context, we find this verse in, in, that same, in that same chapter. It says that they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So let me show you something. Peter one day, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And, and, and it tells us this in, in, in Mark chapter 8. Jesus went to Peter's house. And Jesus went in and there was Peter's mother-in-law sick with a fever. Let me read you the passage. In, in Matthew 8, 14. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand. And look at this. And the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto him. She came into her ministry. She came into the kingdom because of healing. Healing is a powerful, powerful tool. Write that name down. Envision them coming. Envision them being healed. Envisioning them finding their ministry. Envisioning them going on with God. Don't dangle them over hell. But tell them what? The good news. See, that would be good news to that person. Good news. Some of you know people, or some of you have, maybe perhaps children, that are driving you nuts, driving you crazy. And if maybe if you don't have them, you know people that maybe do have them. You see, this is another opportunity to tell someone good news. Jesus did this. Jesus did this. Isn't it amazing that when, uh, that when we have a child that gives us problems, it's just a problem child, but when somebody else has a child that's given them a problem, their child has a demon. <laughs> and really, in either case, the one who is tormented are not, is not the child, it's the parent. You, you with me on that? <laughs> Well, there's this woman in the Bible, and, and she has this child that is absolutely driving her crazy. She's a very wealthy woman. She's from, from Phoenicia, and, and she comes to Jesus, and she begs him to touch her child, to help her child. And, it's, and, that, and that's given to us in, uh, in Mark chapter 7 and verse 26. The woman was a Greek born in Syrophoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. <laughs> See, when you have a child giving you problems, it becomes very difficult to pray for that child. You're so frustrated. 
You're so angry. You, you can't hardly pray for them anymore. You get so mad and you won't even pray for them. Well, let me tell you what to do. If you've got one of those or if you know someone that does, if you'll write their name down and you'll put it in this, in this container at the end of the service, they will be prayed for nearly every day. I know they'll be prayed for on Sunday as well. You might not pray for them, or their parents may not be able to pray for them, or you may be so angry at the child that you can't pray for them, but I'm telling you what, I can pray for them, and he can pray for them, and nearly every day that child will be prayed for. And God's going to move in their life. You get a vision of that child coming into the kingdom of heaven. You get a vision of that family coming into the kingdom of heaven. You get a vision of them sitting in that chair beside you. You get a vision of them coming in and receiving the gospel and watching that child be delivered from that thing that's vexing them. God will do it. He did it for this, what, this woman. Tell you a true story that happened this, this year. This 19, this year. Uh, <laughs> this, this year. <laughs> well, you're uh, 2000 something here, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, well, I'll start to say something I won't do. Let me tell you, let me tell you a true story. There was a mother and a, and a father as a family in our church. And they had a child that was absolutely driving them crazy. I mean, just driving them nuts. And the child ran away from where well, I left home and, and was just, just doing all kinds of, 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 of ornery stuff. And, and, and the parents got to the place where they couldn't even pray for the child anymore. And so we did this service, you know. We did this service where we wrote the names on the cards. And initially, they didn't even write the name down. But one day, one of the parents wrote the name down, put it in the bucket, into the container. And a few days later, something happened. The child began to change. I was very aware of it. I was very aware the situation was going on. I was even helping them try to pray for them. But we, nothing seemed to break through. It wasn't until the name was written and a vision began to happen and we began to pray that this child changed. Today, today, that child is serving the Lord. Today, that child is, is, is home. Now, today, that child is working. Today, that child is giving to the kingdom of heaven. Today, that child is loving God and serving God. What I want you to hear me is, is that there's a power when you write down the name. There's something supernatural that begins to take place. When you begin to vision and envision that individual or that family coming into the kingdom of God. When you begin to envision that child being delivered from that thing that vexes them, from that, from that thing that has them in bondage. And you begin to see that child being obedient and coming into the kingdom. Something spiritual, something supernatural happens. That prayer don't fix that, that anything else doesn't fix. But what will fix it is when you begin to see it in your heart in a vision. It begin, begins to happen. Some of you know people like that. Some of you know families that have rebellious children or maybe you have one. Write that name down. Hang it in a place. A prominence. Start seeing it happen. And I promise you, just as God did for that Syrophoenician woman, He'll do for you. And you can take what the devil, what the enemy meant to harm you and your family, and you can change it around so that God will save much people. Amen. Good news. Tell them the good news. Tell them that God will save that child. God will deliver that child. Tell them the good news. Don't tell them God's going to send that kid to hell. That's not what they need. It might be what they want right then, but it's not what they need. It's not what they really need. They want the child saved and delivered. There's another type of person that I want to talk to us about briefly that I want to make sure that we don't forget about when we're writing uh, names on these cards. There's a man in the Bible, his name is Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus was a very religious person. He had his own Sunday school class. He was very into the teachings of God. And the sad thing about Nicodemus is though he was religious, he really didn't have a relationship with God. He was a religious person, but he didn't even understand being born again. And so Jesus talks to him about that. And so what Jesus says to Nicodemus in and, and, uh, John chapter 3 and verse 10 is this. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you don't understand these things. See, religious, being religious does not mean a person is where they need to be with God. Nicodemus was religious. Now, you know people like this. You know people that are very, there's many religious people. You know people that are religious. And what they need is not religion. They need a relationship. See? What's happened is they've been trapped and sucked down into a religious system. And what they have a relationship with is a doctrine and not a father. 
What I want to encourage you to do is write that person's name on your list. Write that person down. They may be religious, but they need to come into the kingdom of God. They need to hear the good news. See, that's what Jesus did for Nicodemus. He took time and he spent time with Nicodemus. That the rest of chapter three of John and 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 on and when he's talking about uh, you know God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son three sixteen that whole chapter that whole chapter is God taking time and trying to explain to Nicodemus how to be born again and what you need to do with this person that is religious. And they may know the Bible well. Nicodemus knew the Bible, but it was when Jesus spent time and began to open it up to him. He had a vision of Nicodemus coming to Jesus and coming to the cross. He did. Now let me show you what happened. And he'll do this for your Nicodemus as well. Nicodemus came to the cross of Christ. In John chapter 19, and verse 39, it says this. He was accompanied, he here is, is Joseph of Arimathea. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about 75 pounds. That's a lot of money. That's, that's a lot of stuff that Nicodemus was bringing. So these people have a lot to bring to the kingdom. And, and then verse 40 says, Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. Now, God will do that for your Nicodemus. God will bring your Nicodemus to the cross of Christ. But what we've got to do is write their names down. We have to have start seeing a vision of them coming. Write their name down. You start seeing yourself sharing the kingdom of God with them, just as Jesus did. Tell them that the whole born-again experience is so that you can see the kingdom and you can enter it right now. If you're born of the water and of spirit, start sharing with them the realness and the reality of the kingdom. God will deliver them, just as he did Nicodemus from that system that sucked them down and trapped them and bring them to the cross of Christ. See, the good news to Nicodemus wasn't healing. The good news to Nicodemus wasn't even financial prosperity. The good news to Nicodemus was how to be born again. How, what the kingdom of God is really about. You know people like that. They think they're fine. But in reality, they're far from God. Write their names down. Begin to get a vision and begin to envision them coming and hearing the good news of the kingdom. You know people like that. Perhaps you know someone who's lost a loved one or with shattered dreams. Maybe you know someone who's uh, this year, perhaps, lost their job, suffered a divorce. Their dreams are shattered. And what they thought was going to happen in their whole life was going to be like, all of a sudden, it blew apart. Their heart's broken. Their dreams are shattered. The Apostle Peter was this way. The Apostle Peter had totally sold out to Jesus, walked arm in arm with Jesus, spent all of his time with Jesus, sold everything so he could serve Jesus. Matthew chapter 19, and verse 27, says this, Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Peter had left everything for his dream. But when Jesus was hanging on that cross, it appeared that Peter's dream had died. Good news to Peter would have been how to resurrect that dream. Good news to Peter was is that God can come out of that tomb and your dream that you have can still happen. You know people that have broken dreams. Maybe one time they were walking hand in hand with God. Maybe one time they had a ministry and they were serving the Lord with all their might. But their dreams fell apart. And all of a sudden now they're over there in the shadows cussing. If you think of someone like that, maybe they've never served God at all. But they've still experienced broken dreams. What Jesus did was resurrect that dream for Peter. And good news for that person is to help them resurrect their dreams. And let me tell you what next year's primary or beginning at least emphasis is going to be right here. It's going to be the resurrection of dreams. I want to stir your dreams up so much. I want you to pursue your dreams and chase your dreams. I want to help you find your dreams and pursue it and chase after it because that dream is of God in your heart. And what God had done in Peter's heart was giving that dream. And what God did, what Jesus did for Peter, the good news that Peter needed was how to resurrect that dream. Maybe you know people that are sick. Maybe you know people that are sick and have need of words of good news. Or maybe you know people that are, have a, a dream and, and, and the dream's messed up and, and they need good news. Or people that have children that are in rebellion and, and they need to hear the good news. Maybe too, there's another person that I want to make sure that we mention. 
people that have suffered tremendous grief. You know, this year, some of us, though we may not realize it right now, are going to go through times of grief. I think of Daryl Kemp this past year, the grief that his family experienced. They weren't expecting that to happen. People go through griefs, the seasons of their lives. And what Jesus would do in these times is He would reach out and He would use these times of what the enemy meant for evil to turn to good. I think of the woman that, the, that, was, that had her lost, she was a widow woman, and her son had died, her only son, her oldest son, her only son, had passed away. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 12, we read of it. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. See, she'd lost both her husband and she'd lost her son to death. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. See, Jesus shows us that that is a tremendous time to reach people with good news. That is a tremendous time to help them because they're in, they're in a grief mode. They're in a grief state. It is a tremendous opportunity to, to minister to them. Jesus did this time and time again. He did it with Jairus' daughter, remember? He did it with this woman. He did it with Lazarus. Jesus would use these opportunities of what the enemy meant for bad, for harm. He would take it and he would make it good. He would resurrect that person for them. That's the good news that people need in grief. What I mean by that is, let me give you this example. In 1999, my dad died. Uh, he and I were opposite personalities. I am a lion temperament, run, run, run through life, going that everything is just hardened as fast as I can. Daddy was totally opposite. He was an ox personality. and He loved to just sit outside and watch the sprinkler go around. I can't do that, but he liked to do that. He just, he just, you know, they used to kid him. Lance and Bonnie and all of them used to kid him about driving. Boy, uh, Grandpa, when you drive, we can see between the trees. But when Daddy drives, man, other things just a blur. And I, I'm like that in life. You know, I'm, 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 I'm running. I've got things I want to do. I want to be busy. I want to accomplish something. I want to do something with my life. And so I'm always running. And Daddy and I were opposites. Daddy was always telling me, Delbert Ray, that's my name, Delbert Ray. Delbert Ray, you need to slow down and smell the roses. Daddy died in 99, and not very long ago, Judy was, had gone somewhere, I think, down to Griffin to see her sisters. I'm not real sure exactly where it was, but I do know what happened. And she and I were instant messaging each other on, on the Internet. And I was, for some reason, telling her about the events of my day. And I, was tell, and I had run by something. It was something that I should have done. I don't remember what it was exactly, but I had run right past something and hadn't done something that I should have done. And I was sharing that with her in typed words. And she was responding to me, and then she did this. She wrote back, and she says, yeah, you do need to slow down. She says, as someone famous once said, Delbert Ray, you need to slow down and smell the roses. <laughs> you know what happened as I read those words? My daddy was resurrected in my heart. There was daddy right there talking to me and telling me. You know, maybe we can't get them up out of a coffin. But we can resurrect that person in someone's heart. We can tell them the good news of what that person meant to them. We can tell them the good news just like she did to me. She raised him for me. And there he was. And we can do that for people. And we all know people that go through grief times. We need to reach out for them, to them. We know people right now maybe that are grieving. And if you do, then write their name down. Envision yourself talking to them and giving them good news. Finding some way of sharing and resurrecting that person in their, in, in their hearts for them. Find some way of getting that person to church and using that as an opportunity for what the enemy meant for harm, to harm that person. You change it and you mean it for something good to bring that person deeper into the relationship with the Lord. You bring that person to church and you see that person happy. You see that person rejoicing. You see that person going on. You tell that person that, listen, God can resurrect that person in your heart anytime you need it. Or whatever that might be. Now, if I haven't touched something and made you think of something on your card, now's a good time to put down whoever you want to. But you see, telling them the good news is not preaching to them and dangling them over hell. Telling them the good news is telling them what they need to be ministered to at the time that they're in, the season of their life. 
Telling them the good news is telling them the solution to their situation. Not that they're going to go to hell when they die. It's the goodness of God that brings people to repentance. And what we want to do here at LifeGate is we want to reach people with good news. We believe here at LifeGate that church is good. We believe church should be fun. We believe that it shouldn't be a bondage, but it should be a liberty. We believe that coming here, you should go out of here feeling good and pumped up and ready to go out and, 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 and conquer life. Have it more and more abundantly. He says, I want you to go everywhere and ev to everywhere and, er and talk to everyone. I want you to tell them the good news. He says, I want you to, to take that. I want you to write that down. And I want you to put it in a prominent place in your life, in, in, your, in, your, in your car or your mirror, wherever that it might be, so that you can constantly have that before you like a billboard. So that even when you get busy, you can remember it. I want you to be an ambassador, he says. I want you to talk to people as if I were talking to them. I want you to tell them what I would tell them if I were there. Not that they're going to go to hell when they die, but tell them the good news. Tell them what they need. Minister to them what they need. Show them the kingdom of God. You may know sick people. You may know people with rebellious children. You may know religious people. You may know people with broken dreams. You may know people that are suffering grief. You may know many of other things. Write their names down. Begin to get a vision. What God will do for you is save them. He's going to save somebody this year, right? Why shouldn't it be your loved one? Is there any reason that it shouldn't be? Help him. What he's pleading with you and I today. He's saying, please go. Please go tell everyone you know the good news. Tell them that I love them. Tell them that I have a plan for their life. A plan to prosper them, not to harm them. A plan for their future and their hope. I want to help them. Tell people that. And I tell you what, God's going to bring them in. And He's going to use them mightily in this kingdom. How many believe that God really wants to save your loved ones, the ones you've written down? How many believe that? If you believe that, shout to the Lord and give the God a hand clap. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.